Good morning, and welcome to our worship for this Sunday, January 10th. We're glad that you've chosen to join us, whether this is live as it's streaming at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday or at a time of your later convenience. Either way, we take great confidence in what the Holy Spirit is able to do in uniting our hearts and our minds to, as we come together to worship God in this way. And so we say to you, wherever it is you're joining us, whenever it is you're joining us, welcome to the house of the Lord this day. Let us join together in the call to worship that you see before you. Arise and shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Thick darkness covered us and all the earth, but the Lord has arisen upon us. Lift up your eyes and look around. See how the nations come from far away. We have followed the light to this holy place. We gather in the dawning of the light of God. Let us worship God. Our first hymn this morning is, Oh, Praise the Name by Awaken Worship. Let us worship God now with this song.
But friends, often our praise of God is not what it should be. We don't, we don't magnify God and place God as the first priority of our lives. And, and when we don't do that, often what we do instead is we elevate ourselves. We elevate our will over God's will. And that has a way of leading us into paths of sin. And so as we come now in this time of confession, we come to confess and we also come to repent. That is to seek to change, to be made new and to experience God's grace as God aids us in this. And so let us pray our prayer of confession that you see before you. Light of the world, you pierce the darkness. Penetrate the darkness in our hearts. We hold in the light of your glory all the sins that we have known, all the pain that we have caused, all that causes us regret. We pray that in your mercy and your love, you would once again forgive our sin, remove it from us, and transform us in your holy light so we might draw ever nearer to you for your name's sake. Amen. And now let us silently confess our sins to God. Amen. Please join me in our responsive declaration of forgiveness that you see before you. The Lord has promised to turn mourning into joy, sorrow into comfort and gladness. Christ has ransomed a world of sinners from enemies too strong for us to resist on our own. We are redeemed through the blood of Christ according to the riches of grace which God has lavished upon us. Therefore, let your hearts be still and give thanks to God. And friends, now let us affirm what we believe with the words of the Apostles' Creed that you see before you. Join with me, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And friends, as we now come to our time of the offering, I reminded of the fact that as we've started a new year, there are these traditional meals that people often have on New Year's Day. Like when I was growing up, we always had black eyed peas. And for the pork, my mom made this black eyed peed recipe that had pepperoni in it. So the pepperoni was our pork and we might have cabbage or collard greens and, you know, all those sorts of things that were supposed to bring you, you health and wealth and good fortune and whatever else. And I confess, in my house, we don't really do that, mostly because I don't like a lot of those <laughs> foods anymore. Uh, though Maria did eat pork and collard greens, now that I think about it. But the, what they say is still striking. This idea, you know what, I want to start the year in any way that, that might lead to greater health, that might lead to greater wealth and prosperity. And all of the things that we're seeking in those meals, really, that's, that's something that God bestows on us. God's the one who grants us our health. God's the one who grants us wealth or prosperity, but it's up to us to be good stewards of what God's given to us. And part of that stewardship is returning back to God a portion of what he's given first to us, an acknowledgement of that out of gratitude to say, God, I recognize that you are the giver of all things and I thank you for that. And so I want to thank you folks for continuing to mail in your or drop off your offerings and your tithes uh, during this time. Uh, I really uh, I think that it just says so much about how you are allowing God's Spirit to move in you that even in the midst of all this time in this long, long stretch of pandemic, that you have continued to be so faithful in your giving. Uh, and so we pray now uh, our prayer of dedication, and we'll transition into our prayers of the people as we seek God and ask for God's blessing to be upon us. So let us pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for our health and our wealth and our prosperity. We thank you for all that you have given to us. And we ask God that, that our hearts would always be grateful, that we would always be looking for ways to return 
back to you a portion of what you've given to us because we are so grateful, God. God, you are the God of all creation whose, whose voice causes oceans to tremble and you lighten the darkness. You give form to the void within and you send your spirit as comfort and hope. And so God, we thank you for visiting us with mercy. Your goodness overwhelms us. We can look to you in times of need, rely on you to drive away our doubt, depend on your judgment to curb our folly, and to live in the hope that one day Jesus will reign on this earth. God, there are those whose days are filled with uncertainty. We ask that you invade their gloom with the warmth of your caring love. Give them the sense that you are there. Lift them from feelings of futility. Enable them to grasp your abiding concern. And give us a measure of the compassion that Jesus showed. Help us to be open to all in need that we may become instruments of your mercy. God, we pray for those whose days are filled with aimless wandering. Give to them a sense of your will for their lives, the strength to pursue it, and the discipline to do what you would have them do. Erase from us our need to be critical of those who do not conform to our standards and teach us forbearance as they seek to discern your intentions. Make this day and all our days, God, a celebration of your spirit in our life. Fill us anew with your spirit and cleanse us of our past sins, which estrange us from Christ and from one another. Send us forth as Christ's disciples, abounding in the hope of new life and proclaiming good news to aid the afflicted. We ask that you would give us your blessing, O God of all creation, in whose name we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in our upcoming sermon, we're focusing on this idea of repentance. And so much of what repentance is, is something that we are able to do by the power of the Spirit to experience God's forgiveness and the transformation into like really a new creation. And so for the anthem I've chosen today, this, this one that I wasn't familiar with, but a lot of the lyrics do really jive well with this idea of repentance. Uh, and it's called, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. And it's about Christ's sacrifice for us. And so let our hearts worship God now with this anthem. Blood, blue. 
One of the most important concepts of our Christian faith is also one that jives the least with our society, and, and I get why, but really the problem with it, it's on us. Like, it's, it's our baggage that makes it hard and painful, not God's, and it's this concept, this word, repent, repentance. Like, maybe it's a loaded word. Maybe when we hear it, it, there's some part of us that flashes to these images of this, like, fire and brimstone preacher just screaming it out, like, repent! And, and we're like, whoa, that's, that's, that's not for us. Or maybe we associate the word too much with ideas of, of hellfire. Like, how in my hometown, there were these signs that would say repent, but each of the letters were surrounded by this flame very much giving you the impression like, hey, if you don't do this, then you're going to burn in hell. And really, like, what's, what's to enjoy about that message? To be honest, passages like the one that we're about to hear from Luke can feed into that perception as well. But if we're wise and able to discern God's Spirit, we can actually hear the call to repentance for what it is, as a call to freedom, a call to joy, and a call to new life. And so we'll be reading our gospel message today, talking about John the Baptist and his call to others to repent and to bear fruits that are worthy of repentance. And it's Luke chapter 3, verses 2 to 16. And as we come to God's word now, let us come again to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you so much for this word. We thank you that we are able to read your word, to study your word, often at our leisure, at times of our choosing, God, and that we have the freedom and the ability to do it. God, we pray that our hearts would be warmed by your Spirit, that that we would seek you and want to know you more and more. And God, help us to be honest with ourselves, to see the ways that we do need to repent and and to be open to your presence in our life. God, I ask that, that these words I say, that they would be your words. And if anything I say is not from you, God, then let that fall away. But let everything from you be planted in the good soil of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So beginning at verse 2. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the books of the words of the prophet Isaiah, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. 
as the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, at least I'm not going to call you a brood of vipers, as John called the people. I mean, man, John the Baptist, he really does not mince words. And I actually think that, that much of John's original audience may have been just as offended by being told that they need to repent as, as many in our modern times now are. Now, this type of repentance that he's outlining, it, it just wasn't the kind of thing that Jews at his time did. Like he called them to be baptized for their sins. And baptism was something that Gentiles who converted to Judaism did. They were the ones who had to bear fruits worthy of repentance. Not Jews, not the, not the children of Abraham. By their very birth, Jews believed that they could just, at that time, they believed they could sort of go through the motions. They could make some sacrifices. And, and that was that. But to actually have to humble oneself to admit that you were wrong. People hate that. People have always hated having to admit that they're wrong. And I think that's actually part of another reason for, for our hang up with this call to repent. We live in a time when no one wants to admit that they're wrong. And even if proven wrong, you can just keep on claiming that you were right over and over again, hoping that if you say it loudly and often enough, people will believe you as if you could just like Jedi mind trick your way into having people believe that wrong is actually right. I still remember in the early days of internet availability, I remember having an argument with someone about, about some trivial thing. And it might've been as silly as like what actress was in some movie or not. Like, do you remember having arguments like that, by the way? Like, back in the day, before you could easily access such information, people would just argue ad nauseum about these things. And, and now we can just pull out our phone and look it up. And, and those sorts of arguments, they're really no more because we can just settle it very quickly. Like, who's right? Who's wrong? Well, at the end of the heyday of such arguments like that, I was having one of them with someone. And we were arguing about, like I said, maybe what actress was in a movie or not. And instead of of just arguing, suddenly I'm like, oh wait, we can look this up on the internet. And so I go to like the internet and, and I look up the cast of the film and, and show this person that the actress isn't in it. And, and instead of it just being over and, and her admitting that she was wrong, I'll never forget it. She said, but Evan, don't you see? I felt like I was right. Like, like, like that was supposed to to be the end of it. So because, because you, you genuinely felt like you were right, I'm supposed to accept your ignorance as being as valid as actual fact? Um, what? what? So, so yeah, people, people don't like to, to be wrong in this day and age. And I think that's some of the baggage that we carry with this word repentance. But at the same time, if we haven't accepted that something is wrong and, and learned how and why it's wrong, then how can we ever grow? How can we know what's right? Like sometimes it's hard to help people see what's right and what's wrong though. And raising kids for me has, has been a great way to see this. Like just this week, Asher ran over his baby sister Evie's hand with this new toy of his. And she's crying and crying and we fuss at Asher because we'd been warning him very specifically to be careful and to watch out for his little sister so that he would not run over her with his toy. And then he does it. And so we tell him no. And we ask him to like, look at how he's hurt his little sister. And Asher, <laughs> well, he wasn't really all that sorry. He didn't seem to regret it. So I sent him to the corner. And suddenly, Upon hearing he has to go to the, cor the corner, his eyes are, are Niagara Falls and, he, and he's wailing and whining like, he, like his going to the corner is the greatest injustice in all the world. And that's what he's upset about. 
Not that he hurt his little sister. He's upset that he has to go to the corner. And so now he's saying he's sorry over and over again. And because he's being punished, now he likely means it even. He is sorry he hurt her. But he's really sorry because he just doesn't want to go to the corner. But the thing is, like, I, I wasn't looking for him to say he was sorry. I wasn't even looking for him to, to actually feel sorrow. What I want is for him to change, to learn from this and not to then run over his little sister with anything, to listen to us as his parents when we had given him guidance and because we could see what was going to happen. That's what I want. And essentially what I'm saying is I want true repentance from him. Now, I've said this before, and you've probably heard it before, but repentance doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. Repentance doesn't mean saying you're sorry. It doesn't even mean asking for forgiveness. The Greek word that we translate as repentance, when you see it in the Bible, the word repentance in Greek is the word metanoia. And metanoia, it's a compound word, meaning there were two parts to it that were put together to make one word. And meta is a prefix that then takes on a different meaning based on what the second part of the compound word is. And so based on the case, meta in this instance means to go beyond or to change. Like we have that in our word metamorphosis, like a change of form. This meta means to change or to really to go beyond. And noia in this case is the word for mind. We have that also in the English word paranoia, another Greek word para, in this instance meaning out of and noia of mind. We, we've kept that one, paranoia. Well, this is metanoia, to go beyond the mind, to change the mind. Now, metanoia does mean a change in the mind, but it's not just about like some fickle changing of the mind as we often change our minds on a daily basis. See, for the Greeks at this time, there was no loftier or higher concept than that of the mind. The mind meant like not just what you thought, the mind stood for the essence of who you were. And so metanoia meant that, that you looked at your behavior and you realized that you wanted to be different. You, you wanted change. And the change was so profound, your entire mindset was different. And now it's to the point you were almost like a different person. Some might even go so far as to say that true metanoia, True repentance results in you becoming something totally new, like this brand new creation. That's what repentance was then, and that's what it is now. Repentance isn't about saying you're sorry and hoping we can just move past all this. Repentance is to see one's error and actually greet the reception of this, revel the reception of this revelation of error with joy. To say, thank God I can move past that now. Thank God I don't have to do it all that way anymore. In his book, Runs with Horses, Presbyterian pastor and author Eugene Peterson, who's the same guy who did that paraphrasing of the Bible called The Message that I know a lot of people love. Well, in his book, Runs with Horses, he writes this about change. And really, he's talking about repentance. He says this. To be told we are wrong is sometimes an embarrassment, even a humiliation. We want to run and hide our heads in shame. But there are times when finding out we are wrong is sudden and immediate relief. And we can lift up our heads in hope. No longer do we have to keep doggedly trying to do something that isn't working. A few years ago, I was in my backyard with my lawnmower tipped on its side. I was trying to get the blade off so that I could sharpen it. I had my biggest wrench attached to the nut, but couldn't budge it. I got a four foot length of pipe and slipped it over the ridge handle to give me leverage. And I leaned on that, still unsuccessfully. Next, I took a large rock and, and banged on the pipe. By this time, I was beginning to get emotionally involved with my lawnmower. Then my neighbor walked over and said that he had a lawnmower like mine once. And, and that if he remembered correctly, the threads on the bolt went the other way. I reversed my exertions and sure enough, the nut turned easily. I was glad to find out I was wrong. I was saved from frustration and failure. I would never have gotten the job done, no matter how hard I tried doing it my way. What a great image that is. How often have we doggedly kept doing something a certain way, convinced that we were right, 
Or how often have we not critically examined why we do things, instead falling back into routine and habit, and then we, we wonder why things don't change in our lives. The people who came to John to be baptized, even though that wasn't the social convention of the day, because as I said at that time, Jews didn't get baptized. That was for Gentile converts to Judaism. But they came. And John told them how to change their lives, how to get back on the right track. Luke's original audience needed to hear this, as we all do as well. So realize that our sin, the things that keep us from growing in spiritual maturity, really the things that keep us from being the new creations God is calling us to be, these things can be cast off, and doing so can be experienced as great freedom. Now, many times giving up something, even something that's not good for us, well, that can be scary. Or we won't believe that we can do it. And on our own, we likely can't. But by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in our lives and by our own willingness to allow the Spirit to transform and change who we are so that we can experience that true metanoia, that true repentance, that by that power, we can. And as we do that, our lives will, as the Bible terms it, bear fruit. Fruit being like the sweetest of things that one could have back in that time. I mean, think about the joy that can come at the end of a meal when you have like a good slice of pie or cake or maybe some nice coffee with it. That, that sort of satisfaction, that, that's what fruit meant to them in their time. And that's what our lives are to be like for others. Fruit that points back to God. So as John says, we should do Let our lives bear fruit that is worthy of repentance, worthy of being the new creation that God has created us to be in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, our final hymn for today is called His Mercy is More. Let us praise God now with this hymn.
praise the Lord, His mercy is more. And so, friends, I challenge you to bear fruit that is worthy of repentance, as worthy of being the new creation that God has called us to be. Realize that often we are going down wrong paths, and it can actually be a relief to turn around and turn back to God so that we can experience the joy and freedom that comes from being made new in Jesus Christ. And so, friends, go in peace. Serve the Lord in gladness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.